Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to V1 Online. It's the 11 a.m. service. 11 a.m. service. Hey, I'm Pastor Chad. I'm here today with Vic. We're so glad to have you here today. We are uh, about to dive into our 11 o'clock service. We had a great 9 a.m. service. Sure did. Now, one of the most important things that you can do if you're watching online with us to connect with us is make sure you connect with us in the chat. In the chat. And we'd love for you to join with us if you like something that the pastor says. Hit amen. amen. If you have a question, our chat, our chat moderators will be there to answer those questions. So connect with us in the chat. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Vic, next week is it's Easter. It's Easter. It's Easter week next week. So let me ask you this: uh, Easter's a big. It's a family day. Yes, sir. It's a big holiday. What do, do you guys in your family? Do you have any kind of traditions you guys do for Easter? We do. We do. So we would, we go to church, of course, on mm-hmm. Easter. After church, then we then proceed to go home. To have a Last Supper meal. We're talking about everything. Supper? Well, not a Last Supper. I mean, because Jesus is risen, amen. So, <laughs> anyway, it's some good food. That's, right. that's what it's including. Then after that, then we would watch a Tyler Perry movie. How Tyler about you? Perry movie, yeah. We, um, you know, Easter's a long day working at the church. It is. So, Easter's always going to be church, food, a nap, and Easter egg hunt. The nap. It's the nap. About them it's, Sunday it's, naps. It's a crucial part of it Easter is. Sunday. Amen. But, I mean, it's Easter season. We are so excited. We've got some things that are coming up that are uh, related to Easter. We want to make sure that you are aware about. So, yesterday we had to cancel our third annual explosion. It Sunday. rained in the morning. It rained in the Rain. night. Um, and so we just uh, kind of made a made a decision and canceled the service. But we want to make you aware those thirty thousand eggs are not going to waste. If you've got kids, bring them here on Easter, Easter Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. What's happening Easter Sunday with those Easter eggs? Easter Sunday, they're gonna have about what 10,000 10, eggs out there at the per end of service. Easter, per service. Yes. So Easter egg hunts will happen inside of Kids Church. So make sure you bring your kids here, drop them off in the kids building. They're gonna have a massive kids egg gonna hunt. They're gonna have a blast. You're gonna pick them up with lots of, uh, lots, lots of eggs. Amen. Amen. Vic, what's, what, do we have, what do we have happening this Wednesday? This Wednesday, we normally have Life Wednesday. Yep. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to cut it. Um, because it is Easter week, right, mm-hmm. in preparation for Good Friday. Yep. Right? And so um, there will be no services on Life Wednesday, no yep. youth, no kids, and no adults. So if you come here and the parking lot is empty and it's dark, it's going to be that's empty. Why. That's it. That's it. That's why it is. And so, like Vic said, we're uh, canceling Life Wednesdays because we will have a Good Friday service. This year, a Good Friday service is happening at 6 p.m. It's going to be a time of reflective time as we remember the heaviness and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. We're going to have songs. We're going to have communion. We want to kind of encourage you to come as we kind of center our hearts on what Easter is all about, which is really the sacrifice of Jesus. Mm. That's good. And then after, well, Good Friday, right? It's Easter. We got Easter Sunday, baby. So we got three services. We have the 8.30 service, the 10 o'clock service, and then the 11.30 service. Yep. Um, we will be having a lot. We, we would, first of all, encourage you guys, if you guys are watching online, come join us on Easter Sunday. Yep. Person. That would be awesome. Yep. Um, but if you guys are here, you guys are coming for Easter Sunday, it's going to be packed. So make sure you guys get here on time. You be, guys late. be here on time. It's going to be an incredible day <laughs> here is. on service. It's be Three, a services. Day. Three services. None of them are at 9 or 11. So make sure you check that schedule. Get here at the time the service starts. Man, we've got about 15 seconds. We're going to head to the stage. Your worship team's out there getting ready for worship. I just want to really encourage you today. We've got an awesome message by Pastor Mark called The Torn Veil, about the access we have to God. So let's recognize that God is for you. He wants to meet you in this moment. Let's head to the stage this morning for worship. Amen.
sun was darkening in the heavens thunder for a moment death had thought it conquered but it wasn't over till you said it's over your body broken as you restore to us what sin had stolen once and for
we love you this morning. Jesus, you are the name above every name. God, there is nobody like you. None compares to you. So Father, we lift up our adoration knowing you are the only one worthy this morning. God, you are the only one who is perfect. So Father, we submit ourselves to you. We just say, have your way in this place. Have your way in our lives and in our hearts. Father, we choose to remember how good you are. Lord, we love you. And it's in your mighty name that we worship and we pray this morning. And God's church said, amen. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Well, V1, you chose a great day to be here this morning. We believe that there is nowhere else you should be except for in God's house this Sunday morning. I believe that God has a special word just for you. So now what's gonna happen are the lights are gonna come up a little bit, the band's gonna play. I wanna encourage you, shake a hand, meet someone you've never met before, and we'll be right back. Good morning, saints. I see there's none of those in here. Good morning, sinners. There they are. There they are. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? I'm, yes, it is. I'm Pastor Mike. I'm the global pastor here, and I love, love, love what God is doing in this church. I was sitting with a group of executives the other day, and they wanted us to put down on a piece of paper some of the most life-transforming events ever in each of our lives. Quickly, I went to this. I was, I was sitting at a college, and I think I was 22, maybe 23 years of age, and I was a Christian only a short while, and I was getting, I was working with the church, and and I was real good about giving 10 percent of my income to the church because I knew that's what the Old Testament said. And and but a missionary came to that uh, service that day, and I'd never thought about doing anything other than doing 10 percent of my income. And all of a sudden, uh, I felt like the I got a God nudge, and I felt like the Lord told me, "You should give that missionary 50 dollars a month." for the rest of this year. I didn't have any money. I had all the money I had. I spent it on getting to college. And I was wrestling with that, and my heart was torn up because the people he was going to needed the gospel, and, and, and the Lord kept nudging me. Pl make a, fill out a pledge card, $50 a month. I said, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't and then I remember that voice saying to me, we can do this your way or my way. That's the first time I'd ever heard the Lord tell me that. And he's told me that many times before, since then. He said, we can do this your way or my way. I pulled out a pen. I wrote $50 down on a piece of paper and said, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but by faith, I'm going to give $50 a month for next year. When I got a little extra work, and man, I made the first one, the second one, got to the end of the year, and for the first time in my life, I had given $600 to missions, and I was just amazed. I was just thankful to the Lord that he provided that that, that way, but it took faith. Then I went to sign up for my second year of college, and I walked in, and this is a private college, so it's very expensive, and I walked in to sign up, and the lady said, someone's paid your entire next year's bill for your college. And I, and I heard that voice again. That voice came back again and said, we can do this your way or we can do this my way. And I learned faith by putting down a $50 a month pledge to a missionary. And God took me a lot of places and much, much bigger faith adventures than I'd ever was able to do 
But I want to challenge you, if you've not done this, it will wake up something in your life. It'll wake up some faith, and you'll see some things happen because of this. And I don't know if, if every one of you, I know many of you don't have this card, but you see that QR code on the wall there? If you didn't make a pledge last week, man, I'd get in the game. I'd get in the game. If you and I were riding down the road and you'd say, what's one of the number one things I can do to better my life? I'd say, get in that game right there. And when you, what, what you make happen for God, God will make happen for you. And I promise you, that has worked a hundred times over my life, Karen's life. And um, so our ushers are going to come and they're going to wait on us for our morning uh, worship with our giving. And if you want one of those cards, just hold your hand up. Uh, if you're old school, you like cards. If you're new school, go to that uh, QR code. Or you can hit that QR code at the back, in the seat back in front of you. If you just take your phone out, you hit that. It says a missions pledge. Don't do what I'm telling you to do. Do what the Lord is telling you to do. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask the Lord to speak to you about doing something to build your faith, to make it stronger in how you do th- your finances. Would you bow your hearts with me as I pray for you? Father, I just pray right now that the Holy Spirit will breathe across this entire congregation as he brooded across the face of the deep. Holy Spirit brood across every life in this building right now. Speak to our hearts. Nudge somebody to do something for world evangelization. Nudge somebody to come out of their comfort zone. Speak to us, Lord. Our hearts are open. Our minds are listening. Now I'm going to give you about 10 seconds of silence. And if God speaks something to your spirit, I want you to do it. Amen. 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 Come receive my little offering here, young man. You're a lot better looking than he is. Hey, watch what's happening around here. Go to the screens, guys. Good morning, church. We're so glad you're joining us today. Here's this week's church news. Are you new here at V1? If so, welcome home. Take a moment and fill out the blue connect card and drop it in one of the buckets near the exit when you leave today. Our annual business meeting is tonight here in the worship center. If you're a voting member, we would love to see you there. Our Good Friday service will be on March 29th at 6 p.m. Join us as we reflect on what Jesus endured on his way to the cross. There will be no kids ministry for this night. And as we reflect on the crucifixion, please be aware some content for this night may not be suitable for younger children. And finally, Easter season will be on March 31st. We will have three services, 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. Join us and invite a friend as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. There's always so much going on here at B1, from events and services to small groups and Bible studies. If you want to find out more information about things happening here, visit visaliafirst.com slash church news. Now let's head back to the stage. Hey, everybody. Good to see you in the house of God this morning. Take your Bibles. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. We'll get going here in a second. Just want to remind you of a couple of things that they've just, just given to you in the announcement video. I want to remind you of the annual business meeting tonight. Just reemphasize that. Uh, That's for our members. If you're not a member but you like to know what's going on, you can come and observe. We welcome you to do so. Uh, For members, uh, be here. We promise to make it short, brief, to the point. Starts at 5 to make it uh, hopefully a little more convenient for your schedule, get you out sooner. Uh, We hope to have you in and out in less than an hour. Uh, But come and join us. And then also remember the Easter service is coming next week. I totally blew it last service. I don't know what's wrong with me. I gave them all the wrong times to be there, so I'm going to try to get it right, 830 10 and 11 30 to do all right miss merrill okay she says yes okay i got it right this time so be here next week and i just want to give this as a tip you know uh this is going to be a heavily attended weekend next week and uh and our church has been in a really strong growth mode 
So I just want to encourage you if, you, if you want to get out of the congested services, some of the larger ones where it's difficult to get in and out, really want to encourage you toward the 830 service. Uh, that's the least attended of all of them. That will help us somewhat. Uh, but again, you do what's best for you. But if you make it to, the other, to one of the other services and it's congested, just, just help the Lord out by being nice out there, folks, okay? Those parking lots can be a rough place to be. It can be very frustrating. So just smile a lot. Pray before you get here. You know, don't cuss somebody out. That's not good, okay? So just, just, just work with us next weekend, and we'll try to make it as easy as possible for you. Also, uh, we just sang a song here uh, that was called Communion, uh, Look at What the Blood Has Done. I just want you to know that's, that's not a, a song you're going to hear on the radio. It's not going to be a song that you hear at other services or, excuse me, other churches. That was written by our team. That was written by Pastor Medee and all those folks. Yeah, man, isn't it a great song? So proud of them. So proud of them. Yeah, I just want to give a, just a shout-out of appreciation for what they're doing and the, the things they're putting together creatively. It's, it's a great blessing. This morning, I want to share with you a message that I intended to preach next week on Easter Sunday. Uh, I was traveling this week, uh, had meetings uh, out on the East Coast, uh, had a lot of difficulty making it back. Uh, United Airlines has just about worn me out this week. Uh, flights delayed, uh, missed flights in San Francisco, had to spend the night, supposed to be home Friday, didn't home, get home till yesterday afternoon. Just one of those, ah, just drive you crazy kinds of deals. And uh, uh, no internet at times, no Wi-Fi. And so I, I was really having difficulty. I was trying to go a different direction with the message. And God kept pointing me back to this message that I'd intended to preach for you next week. And I believe that's because God has a word for somebody today. Uh, I just want to say this, we, we, we have prayer every Sunday morning before service and uh, the prayer team and ushers and uh, musicians, pastoral staff, we gather around in a big circle here on this platform to pray. And um, prayer went a little bit different this morning where only I prayed. Normally it's several of us praying. And as I began to pray this morning, I just felt an authority. I, I mean, sometimes you pray and Man, sometimes like the heavens are brass, you don't feel some, feel anything. And sometimes you pray and it's like, wow, I, I just, I've connected into something. I felt that authority. And I think that authority is still here. And I sense God moving and I sensed him moving into worship. And I really think God wants to say something to someone today that will really take you beyond where you are. Some of you are really feeling hindrances in your life. And I just wanna tell you that Jesus has done what's needed to get us past our hindrances through the title of this message this morning, The Torn Veil the torn veil, because that veil ripped from top to bottom, he's given you access beyond your hindrances. So let's, let's look at it today, Matthew 27, verse 51. The Bible says, then behold, the veil of the temple, this is the temple in Jerusalem, was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Let me read it one more time. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Father, this morning, thank you that uh, there is authority in this house. And Lord, it's not my authority, it's your authority. God, I today I just wanna lend myself to you for your authority to flow through me, for your anointing, your grace, your power, uh, your strength, Lord, to flow through this message into the hearts and lives of people that God would experience something today. Lord, we've come more than just for the acquisition of head knowledge. We've come, Lord, for a change in circumstances, a change in heart, a transformation in our life. Lord, come today and do what seems to be impossible by the standards of men. Lord, because of your torn veil, we have access into your presence today. And God, help us to seize it, help us to live in it, help us to never forfeit it in our lives. And God will give you all the glory and praise for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. The torn veil. Yeah, I've noticed sometimes the best sermons have no words. And you say, Pastor, that's what's wrong with your preaching. You just got too many words going on. And I want to say pray for me because sometimes I can go a little too long. But sometimes the best sermons have no words. No words are needed. There's an old saying that says, a picture is worth a thousand words. And it's true. It's not hard to understand why. We all love a good story or a powerful illustration that makes truth come alive for us. Well-chosen object lessons are a great way to teach spiritual truth. And at the moment that Jesus died on the cross, God gave one of the best word picture illustrations that could be ever given through the dramatic fashion in which the way the veil in the temple in Jerusalem was literally ripped from top to bottom. This veil is sometimes called the curtain. 
There's a massive curtain that we'll talk more about as we get through the message this morning, but God tore that veil to speak to us about some things in our lives. No one who was a part of that first century audience could have dreamed of such a thing ever happening. No thinking or thoughtful Jewish person could miss the impact of that unprecedented event. As Jesus hung on the cross and cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. My work, my mission on earth is done by dying, by shedding my blood. At that moment, the Bible says that the earth began to quake. That's significant because Israel is not in an area of the world that has any seismic activity. And yet, even uh, geologists have confirmed that during that particular time in which Jesus should have been alive, that an earthquake occurred in the Middle East, one of the few that's ever happened in the history of the world. And that earthquake happened because God began to shake the earth and literally ripped that veil in the temple that was, uh, that was there to separate men from the presence of God, tore it in two in order to speak and to shout to us a message that we need to hear. Whenever you see an incident from the life of Jesus repeated in the other gospels, it multiplies exponentially the truth that God is trying to convey. Notice in the tearing of this veil that Matthew mentions it. We read about it this morning from Matthew 27. We know that Mark mentions it. We know that Luke mentions it. That's significant today in terms of the impact that it had. But what does it mean? I want us to consider some answers this morning to what the tearing of the veil meant. Number one, it meant a roadblock removed. Write that down, a roadblock removed. Everything about the Jewish temple screamed at people to stay away. There was nothing welcoming about the Jewish temple. There were courts that, are, that were set aside for women and Gentiles where they could only come so close. There was a brazen altar upon which sacrifices had to be made. There were steps, many steps leading up to the temple. It was not ADA compliant. If you were in some way disabled or had a handicap in your life or were limited in your movement, they just assumed that you would stay away. There, there was no place for you there. Inside the temple, there were two main rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. We call it the holy of holies. And only the priests could enter the holy place and only in a certain way and only at certain times to do very specific religious functions. No one ever just hung out in the holy place. This was not the fellowship hall. This was not the commons. There was no coffee bar in the holy place. People did not stand around and mix and mingle and shake hands and give hugs. That was not the purpose of the holy place. You came to do God's business and you got out of there. It was not a place for fun. It was not a place of laughter. Important work was being done there by men of God who were, were set apart by the Lord to do these very specific things. But there was yet a place even more sacred, even more serious than the holy place now I'm talking about the most holy place or the holy of holies. The very center of Jewish worship took place in this very small, confined place called the holy of holies. And if you read Leviticus 16, and it's some very dense reading, it's very heavy stuff, you can find the details spelled out, but let me just summarize it for you quickly from Leviticus 16. That scripture tells us that only one man could enter the holy of holies, and that was the high priest. Not just any ordinary priest, but the main dude, the main priest in all of Israel. He could only enter the most holy place one day each year. That was on the Day of Atonement. He must wear special garments. We'll talk about that more in a moment. He must bring with him the blood of a goat. And then beyond that, he must sprinkle the blood of the goat on the golden mercy seat that was on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which contained a, the Ten Commandments. So just get this in your mind. The priest had to go in with blood. He had to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. This was a, a lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant, golden angels there, and he would sprinkle it there between the two outstretched an, uh, angels. It was said that when he did that, that the presence of God would manifest over those, that, that lid, over the Ark of the Covenant. At that particular time, God did not live inside the hearts of men and women like he does today. Today, God lives inside of me, God lives inside of you, but not in those times. He lived in that box. He lived in the Ark of the Covenant. You could only go to meet God at one place in the world at one particular time. And this was all of the, the, the ritual and the routine that was built around this moment. Because if anyone else besides the high priest ever entered into the most holy place, he would be struck dead. Say dead. Say that a little louder. Say dead. He'd be struck dead. If the high priest entered on any other day than the Day of Atonement, he would be struck dead. 
If the high priest came without the blood of a goat, he would be struck. Yeah, you're catching on. If he entered into that place spiritually unprepared, like he had sin in his heart, he would be struck dead. This was so true that when they made the special garments, when God prescribed how the garments should be made, they literally sewed into the garments of the priest little bells, almost like we would see at Christmas time. And as he would walk, those bells would chime, little ch 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 And there would be people standing outside the most holy place who would be listening to see if the bells continued to ring, if he was still moving. Because if the bells stopped chiming and they could not hear the movement of the bells, they would surmise in that moment that he had been struck dead. So much so that they tied a rope around his ankle before he went into the, the Holy of Holies. And if the bells stopped chiming and God struck him dead because he was unprepared, they would take the rope and drag his dead body out of the presence of God. This was serious stuff. There was nothing welcoming about the temple. The temple in itself was a huge roadblock. The whole system screamed, stay away, don't come near. You're not qualified to come on your own. It was as if the temple itself was a big stop sign, making sure that no one could come into God's presence uninvited. If the Jews were tempted to forget about these things, if the Jews were tempted to take matters into their own hands, God had ordered that a veil, actually a very thick, huge curtain be hung between the holy place and the most holy place to remind them of their necessary cautions. Now, when we think of a curtain, we think about something like the living room drapes at your house. So if you were to look at your drapes today, that you curtains you would hang in your living room for decoration or maybe to keep the sun out, it would be about thin like that, just a, a piece of cloth that hangs there for some like decorative purpose. But that was not what the curtain in the temple was like. In fact, I want to try to illustrate it for you as best I can to give you some of the dimensions. Exodus 26, 31 describes it as a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with finely twisted linen with cherubim, that's angels, woven into it by skilled craftsmen. But the Jewish writers say that it was 60 feet long, it was 20 feet tall, and woven to the thickness of a man's hand. So can we just kind of map that out this morning? I was looking, it might be sort of like the screen here, but I'm not gonna take the chance. I'm gonna start over here. I did this in the early service and I walked so far, I almost went off the platform. So let me get over here a little further. But I'm gonna take paces here that's roughly about 60 feet. So literally starting here from this microphone, it was 60 feet wide. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So look from that microphone over to here, that's how wide it was. And we know it was 20 feet tall. I'm six feet tall, so it's literally three and a half times taller than me. Probably about uh, 50% taller than our screen this morning. So imagine a 20 foot tall curtain. It is spanning this massive distance, distance that I just paced for you. And it was not thin like your living room drapes. It was as thick as a man's hand. So thinking about a curtain woven so many times together that the thickness of this thing was as wide as my hand. This was no ordinary curtain. This was a massive thing. The Jewish scholars go on to write that it took 300 men to hang this curtain. Yet in a moment by which God decided according to his power, in a moment where God recognized the sacrifice of his son, at the moment by which God heard his son say, it is finished, he literally tore that curtain like a sheet of paper. And in tearing that curtain like a sheet of paper, he was ripping through all of the restrictions, the prohibitions, the hurdles, the obstacles, and the hoops that kept men from God. He was saying in that moment, I'm giving you access into a whole different lifestyle. All the roadblocks that have been there before, I am wiping them away. I have kept you at arm's length, but now I'm drawing you to my heart. Such a curtain could never be torn in two by hands of men, only God could tear apart a curtain like that. That's why Matthew tells us that the curtain was torn from top 
to bottom, signifying that God had done what only God could do. In fact, when we begin to think about the impossible situations of our life and the miracles that God needs to perform on our behalf, we can take heart today knowing that there is a torn veil in the temple that literally says that God can do what only God can do. And there are some things today for which we do not have power, we do not have money, we do not have resources, we do not have wisdom that we can trust today that God will do all by himself because God has enough power to remove the roadblocks in our way. But more astounding than the tearing of a curtain like that, like pieces of paper, the purpose, the why behind the veil's removal is far more mind-blowing. Yes, the The torn veil meant that a roadblock had been removed, but let's let's write down the the second thing here, but it also signified a pathway opened, a pathway opened. He tore the veil so that he could open up a pathway. I wanna read to you a passage of scripture taken from Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. I want you to notice the first two words. The first two words are we have. I want you to say that with me, say we have. have. Say that again, say we have. have. Now I want you to personalize and say "I I have. Let me read this for you. I have confidence to enter the most holy place, the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus. Now, 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 wait wait a second, wait, wait. Now, am I talking about just me? No, no, no. Am I talking about the high priest? No, I'm talking about me and you and you and you and you and you and you. I have confidence to enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus, now by a new and living way open for us through the what? The veil, the curtain. That is his body. In this passage of scripture, it says because this veil was torn, I now have access into the Holy of Holies. I can go where God lives. I can meet with God face to face. We have those two words, or I have, speaks of privileges. I looked up privilege in the dictionary and here's what it says. Number one, it's an advantage held by one person or a group of people. Second definition is this. It's an opportunity to do something special or enjoyable. One of the catch your marketing campaigns over the last couple of decades has been American Express's slogan that membership has its privileges. They suggest that by carrying their card, you have more privileges, more benefits, more blessings given to you than by carrying somebody else's card. Let me just say something to you today. As a Christian, membership has its privileges. Don't get it wrong this morning. I'm not talking about membership at V1 Church. I'm not talking about being a Baptist or a Methodist or Assembly of God or Catholic. I'm talking about being a blood-bought, born-again child of God that has membership into the church universal, the big K kingdom, the big C church. I'm talking about being part of God's forever family. When you are a member of God's forever family by being saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, membership has its privileges. It's a great privilege to be a Christian because we have certain advantages given to us by God. Hebrews 10, 19 says that we have the right to enter God's presence directly, that we can go into the Holy of Holies. Several years ago, uh, I was studying for my doctorate and as part of my studies, the particular school I went to required us to go to Cambridge University in England and to study there for about a week and a half. And I was able to take Hayden with me. He was junior high. And after we finished the classes, then we went back down to London and Reagan and Gretchen flew over and we met there and we spent a family vacation there in London. It was kind of one of those trips of a lifetime. And I can remember uh, never having been to London. Uh, we stayed down there on the river uh, that you see the pictures of with the big, the big Ferris wheel, they call it the eye. We stayed right beside the eye. And so we were walking most places where we went. And one day we walked from the parliament building where Big Ben is at, the big clock tower. And we walked from there all the way over to Buckingham Palace where now late Queen Elizabeth lived at the time. And it was pretty cool, I have to admit. I mean, all the history and all the stuff and the pomp and circumstance that the British do. And I wondered in that moment what it would have been like to have gained an audience with Queen Elizabeth. Like I, I could just imagine me rolling up, you know, with uh, my shirt and, and shorts and t-shirt, my fanny pack. I don't wear a fanny pack. I'm not that. I'm not that uncool. And literally rolling in the gates and like, oh, Mr. Merrill, you know, come right in past all the 
tourists there and, you know, roll in there and the, like the queen's waiting on me with like some tea and little biscuits and, you know, and I tell her how pretty she is and, you know, talk and we chit chat and all, all those sorts of things. I can, I can imagine all that, but let me just tell you that did not happen on that vacation. I did not arrive at Buckingham Palace to stroll through the fabled halls of Buckingham. I was not escorted by royal guards with their fancy uniforms. I, I did not sit in the inner chamber and nor was I greeted by the queen. I did not hear her say, what can I do for you, even though I know that she has the power to grant me my request. Meeting with the queen would have been the privilege of a lifetime, but it did not happen. The queen is a very important person. I'm not even a British citizen. I live in the colonies on the other side of the pond. That makes me a stranger. That makes me a foreigner. That makes me an alien. I do not have the standing in any sense to gain an audience with the Queen of England. That privilege does not belong to me. Had I tried to get through the gates on my own, I would have been arrested as an intruder. I would have been imprisoned. I would have been prosecuted because of what I was trying to do. But listen to me, friends. In the eyes of God today, I do have standing with him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords through the blood of Jesus to enter the throne room of heaven any time I want. That's why Hebrews 10 says, when it, or means when it says that Jesus opened a way for us through the curtain, through the veil. By his death on the cross, he tore down that wall that existed between us and God. And now we can go directly to God anytime, any place, anywhere claiming nothing but the blood of Jesus as the only ground of admission. But let me give you a newsflash. If you're not born again, if you're not living for God, if you have sin in your heart, if you're in rebellion against him, if you're separated from God in your sins, you do not have legal standing in the presence of God. You do not have the right to go boldly into the throne room of grace. In that sense, you are an intruder, you're an outsider. But listen to me, friends. You don't have to stand on the outside and look in anymore. You don't have to be separated from the blessings and favor of God. You don't have to live your life without his presence anymore. Today, you can bend your knee and confess Jesus as Lord. You can allow the blood of Christ to wash over your life. And in that moment, he can take you out of a lifetime of sin and usher you into the very presence of God himself for God to forgive your sins and to set you free. Today, God can give you standing. Compared to the old system that kept men out, this is truly a new way because Jesus rose from the dead. It is a living way. Listen, folks, the tabloids need to be writing about us. We are royals. We are personal friends of God's own son. We are a member of God's own forever family. We are citizens of heaven. That gives us standing, that gives us advantage, that gives us entrance, that gives us privilege. And this standing is given to every blood-bought child of God. It's not from me alone. This is God's gift to anyone who will place their trust in his risen son. We have the privilege of an audience with God himself. Anytime, anywhere, and as often as we like. I found a list on the internet of the most influential people in the world. Here were the people that were listed. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Taylor Swift, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, just vote Taylor for president. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, don't do that. Don't, please don't do that. Taylor Swift, Oprah Winfrey, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, a host of other people I've never heard of. I looked at that list and my name wasn't on there. Thank you for laughing at me. Um, yours wasn't either. <laughs> See how it feels? <laughs> and I knew it wouldn't be because I understand these people have a list of advantages that I'll never have from an earthly standpoint. They're part of a very elite club. Some people call it the Illuminati. I'm just, it's a conspiracy theory, I'm just saying. But membership has its privileges. When they talk, everybody listens. They go where I can't go. They can send out a tweet and send stock markets rolling. They have access to the best of everything that the world offers. Five-star hotels, Michelin-starred restaurants, luxury boxes at sporting events. Their every word is quoted in the press, on the internet, social media. That's how the elite of this world rolls. Yet through the blood of Jesus, I have an access 
that not any ordinary person can gain. I have instant access to the throne of God. I have rights greater than those the world counts as very important people. They may get insider tips and tickets to the best Broadway shows, but for each one of us who's washed in the blood of Jesus, we have an all access pass to the throne room of the universe. So it's a roadblock removed. It's a pathway that's open, but let's look at the third thing. It's a hope that's anchored. A hope anchored, write that down, a hope anchored. The tearing of the curtain means that our hope of eternal life has been confirmed by God himself. Let's look at another passage of scripture taken from Hebrews again, but this time from Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the what? The curtain, there it is again. Verse 20, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. These verses boldly confirm that we have an anchor for our soul, for our life, for our existence, for our eternity can't be moved. Uh, I gotta tell you, I, I realize who I am. I am country come to town. I'm like the little country mouse from the cartoons that makes it to the big city and goes, whew, what's going on here? I know where I'm from. I'm from a little town in Oklahoma, 3,000 people, one stoplight. Nobody's ever heard of it, very few people. And I, I can tell you how small and insignificant and backward I felt the first time I went on a cruise ship. How many of you have ever gone on a cruise ship? May I see your hands, please? There's several of you. I recommend it. These things are huge. They're enormous. They're like floating cities. The largest cruise ships in the world with the crew and the pastors holds 9,000 people. That's three times the size of the town I grew up in and it's floating at sea. And I can remember being on that cruise ship and notice that when we went to port for the first time, that they dropped this enormous, I'm talking enormous anchor, chains down into the water, goes down into the ocean floor in order to hold the boat still. The anchor is there not just so much to hold them in the harbor, but it's to hold them in the harbor so they'll be secure when the storms come. Everybody with me? It's there for when the storm comes. Let me give you a, a little principle this morning. An anchor that holds only in fair weather is not much of an anchor. So if you drop an anchor and the anchor appears to do its job, but there's no storms, it's not much of an anchor. It's not much of an anchor if only your marriage is going great. It only gets tested as a real anchor when you go through a divorce. It, it really doesn't prove itself if you've got all the money that you need, but it's an anchor that holds you if you're going through bankruptcy. That's how it proves itself. You see, the, the, the anchor only proves its worth when a storm threatens to move the ship out of the harbor. And in order to hold the ship in place, the anchor must be firmly lodged in the ocean floor. If you drop the anchor in sand, it will not show, hold the ship in place. Hebrews 6 says that our anchor is firm because it's lodged behind the curtain in the very presence of God. We have an anchor that cannot be moved. And if I am in Jesus and Jesus is in me, then my anchor is upon him, the solid rock, which is Christ Jesus. Therefore, when the storms of life begin to blow, I cannot be moved because he cannot be moved. The Bible says that there is now coming a time when everything on earth will be shaken. We're feeling it now. We're, we're in that period of history where everything is shaking around us. But then it says, we will not be shaken for our God is a consuming fire. We have received a kingdom inside of our hearts that cannot be moved. Why? Because we have an anchor behind the veil that is planted in the presence of God himself. This is good news for all who struggle with a sense of their own weakness and failure. And I've been sensing my own lately. I have just been stressed out. Now, I know that's not what the TV preachers tell you, okay? They wanna tell you they're never stressed and they 
walk on water and, and they have coffee with angels. And I'm just going to tell you, I, I need to find out whatever they got going on because that's not really been in my experience. I'd rather get up here and tell you the truth that I'm a lot like you and you're a lot like me. And let me give you the other truth. They're a lot more like you than they pretend to be, okay? I just, just saying, okay. And so the same way that you get worried about stuff and stressed out about stuff, I get worried about stuff and stressed out about stuff. I've been kind of going through that. There's been all kinds of stuff that's just been mounting pressure on me and I'm not sleeping so great and I'm stressed out and I, I'm, my mind is going all these different things, directions and racing. And, and I'm a lot like that man in Mark 9, 24 where I said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Are you with, can you feel me this morning? You know what I'm saying? Lord, I love you. Lord, I believe in you. I do. There's nowhere else to go but to you, Lord. But I just want to tell you something, Lord. I'm having some struggles here. I need some help with my faith here. There's some things I don't understand. And I believe that down deep inside, we do believe. We know that Jesus, Lord, we do love him, imperfect though our love may be. But sometimes when we look in the mirror and our sin rises up to condemn us and we remember with shame the broken promises and the harsh words and the unkind deeds and the sins we've committed and how we failed those who trusted in us, if we meditate on these things too long, we will begin to talk ourselves out of the very fact that we're Christians. I can get so seized up in my own stresses. I'm like, I'll say things to me, what kind of preacher are you? I, 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 can, I can think those things in my head. You can think to yourself, uh, what kind of Christian am I? But the truth is, folks, it's right here. Right here that good theology saves the day. Not how I feel, not how I perceive myself, not what my circumstances tell me, not based upon what I'm going through, not what CNN says, not when, what the papers print, not what social media says, but what good theology, what the Bible says, what Jesus says, as long as our Christian faith depends on us, Jack, we are in trouble. But if our faith ultimately depends on Jesus, then we have a hope that even our shame, our problems, our pressures, our circumstances cannot erase. If the anchor of our soul is Jesus, then we can rest well because our anchor can hold against any storm, even the storms that are self-inflicted. Because friends, this morning, that's the deeper meaning of the torn veil. That's the deeper meaning of the torn curtain because the veil is torn. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who believe in Christ Jesus. Because the veil is torn, the road to heaven is open to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Because the veil is torn, we know that we have eternal life. You see, there is a message for you from the torn curtain in the temple. Here's the message. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come on, say that to yourself right now. Don't be afraid. Come and see. Come to Jesus and see how great this mercy is. J.C. Ryle Summarize the true meaning of the torn curtain in this one sentence. Listen close, quote, our sins may be many and great, but the payment made by our great substitute far outweighs them all. Let me read it one more time. Our sins may be many and great, but the payment made by our great substitute for, far outweighs them all. This just came to me before this service in between. Let's say that you go to Kohl's today. Don't like Kohl's? Let's say, let's go to Target. No, let's not go to Target. <laughs> I kind of messed up there, didn't I? Let's say you go to Macy's at the mall. Okay, you're like, okay, that's better. Okay, well, let's go to Macy's. And you go to Macy's and you go up to the cash register and you buy, us, buy your Easter outfit that you're gonna be wearing next week looking all fine and handsome and you buy some perfume or cologne so you smell good. And you, you go up there and you give them your debit card or cash, check whatever, and they, get, they, they, they make the transaction. What do they give you? They give you a receipt. And then you go out of Macy's and you go back to your car and you walk through one of those scanners and he goes, beep, 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 beep. And everybody in the store turns and looks at you. Okay, that, that happens, it's happened to me before. Then there's some nice person that gets all official with you and says, sir, may I see your bag, please? What he's really looking for is the receipt. If you own something, if it's yours, and it's been properly paid for, 
you should have some receipts. Can I, can I tell you something right now? Some of you are being hindered. You have hindrances in your life, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. There's hindrances in your life and there's something that God has for you that you've not yet received, and it's already yours, and it's already been bought and paid for, and the receipts for God's transaction in your life is the fact that we have an empty cross, an empty tomb, and a torn veil. God has kept the receipts. And when you begin to wonder if you really have it, if it's really yours, if it's really what God has promised you, you gotta remind yourself of the receipts. When the devil tries to take it from you, you say, oh, no, 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 Jack. These are the receipts. God paid for this. Jesus paid for this. Jesus paid it all so that I could have what's been promised to me. As Marco comes back to play, again, I I wasn't supposed to preach this message. This was gonna be the bell ringer for next week. This will be my sugar stick for next week. And yeah, I, man, I didn't want to, but the Lord, the Lord dealt with me. This frustration I've been going through, it's because I, I'm living in the best of times and the worst of times. Our, our church is just growing like a rocket ship and yet our money is falling like a rock. I don't know what's going on, I've never seen it. I've talked to people in the ministry for 50 years, they've never seen it either, never. I had Pastor Chad sitting in my living room till 1 a.m. on Tuesday morning this past week. And we're sitting there talking about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it and cuts to be made or whatever. I, you know, we're just, just, we're just trying to come up with something. Chad runs a graph for me. He's like the grim reaper. He only brings me bad news these days, I tell you. I told him the other day, I said, bro, I hope, I mean, this is starting to hurt our relationship, man. You, you gotta come up with some good news for me. He runs this graph and he says, Pastor, you realize we're up 28% in attendance and we're down 27% in income year over year. How does the church keep growing? It's like, because in the middle, I'm not going, ha, ah, ah, ah. I'm, I'm, I'm losing it. I ain't asleep. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. I'm like, what is going on? So Tuesday morning after that wonderful night's sleep that I didn't get, I came in. We have a, a breakfast with the staff once a month out here in the commons. And we went through the breakfast and they, they all came in and uh, Pastor Blake and Pastor Jason, they, they were welcome, clapping for everybody's birthdays and all this stuff. And then I just came in and just wrecked the room. I mean, I brought the whole room down like womp, womp, womp. Debbie Downer. And I just shared with them the truth of where we're at. Hey guys, you need to watch this and watch that. And man, don't spin and this and that and the other. And we're going through all this stuff. And so I get through and man, everybody's like, Oh man, I just feel like we all need to go home, take a break today, take a nap or something, you know. I go back to my office. And I was really blessed because I saw emails going out. Pastor Austin felt like the Lord had moved on him and I appreciate him for being sensitive, saying, hey guys, based on what Pastor said, why don't we just not have eat lunch, just as fast lunch. And let's come to the, to the sanctuary, as many who can, who don't have other plans, and let's just seek the Lord and pray for an hour. So, I, I couldn't get loose till about 12.30, but 12.30 I came over here and there's about 10 or 12 people over here maybe. And they were walking around, praying over the seats where you're sitting today. And they were, uh, you know, lifting up needs that we have and praying about this stuff that we've been talking about. And so I, I came down here on the front row and, and I was just sitting here and they were walking and I didn't feel like walking. I just, just sat and prayed. I, I knelt right down here in the front and prayed for a while. But the Lord spoke to me. And what he spoke to me, I thought was the thing I was supposed to preach on, but he kept directing me back to this. But he said, I got, I got to talk about this. This is going to be a word for somebody. The Lord, when I was here in the midst of all this context I've given you, he takes me to Daniel chapter 10. I'd love for you to read it when you get home today. It's a weird passage of scripture. Daniel's receiving prophecies from the Lord. And in receiving prophecies from the Lord, he has a, a, a visitation that comes from the angel Gabriel. Now we call Gabriel the messenger angel. He's the one that brings the word of the Lord because Gabriel was also the angel that appeared to Mary to tell her to give her the word that she would bear the Christ child. So it seems like every time Gabriel shows up, he's bringing a word to somebody. So Gabriel shows up to Daniel and says, Daniel, literally the first moment that you prayed, God sent me your direction. And I'm sure Daniel's thinking like, well, where you been, bro? I mean, that's like the traffic bad in LA. I mean, what, what's, going, what's going on? Because he said, he said I, I came the very moment you prayed, but he said for 21 days, Three weeks, I've been held up in the heavenlies. Some of you right now are hindered in the heavenlies. He said, the prince of Persia, referring to a demonic entity, confronted me in the heavenlies and I've been held up, I've been battling in the heavenlies. And I finally made it here to you to give you this word. 
You see, right now, whatever is going on in the hindrances in the heavens above your head, there is something that God's trying to bring to you that Satan is trying to stop. I, I want you to ask yourself, hey, what's on the other side of my hindrance? Let me say that again. What's on the other side of my hindrance? Well, see, when the angel Gabriel got there, he said, this is what I want to speak to you. You can read the whole message, but here's the two things he gave to Daniel in that moment. He said, I bring to you peace and I bring to you strength. Let me say it another way. I bring to you peace and I bring to you power. On the other side of your hindrance today is peace and power. And the way that we know that we get through the hindrance is that we have something that Daniel did not have. We have the blood of Jesus Christ, the empty cross, the empty tomb, and the torn veil that says that nothing that God wants to bring to us, Satan can stop or hinder or obstruct from bringing into our lives. So what is it that you're needing that you're being hindered from? Is it healing? There's power for that. Is it provision? There's power for that. Is there some sort of uh, thing that needs to take place in you to be set free? There's power for that. It's on the other side of your hindrance if you allow the blood of Jesus to work in your life today. Father, right now, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for every life. I thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough that is ours as you break us through the hindrances that are in the heavens, that, Lord, literally you break us through the blockades and the attack and the confrontation that the enemy tries to bring into our life. And, Father, right now, I first of all pray for people who need to be saved, people who feel like intruders, outsiders into the promises of God. Today, Lord, may they surrender their heart, be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Lord, may they appear before you in your presence, but they find access into the throne room of God no longer as strangers and foreigners and aliens, but Lord, as, as children of God, that they can find access to you. Do it, Lord, today as you convict their heart and draw them to yourself. Lord, also I pray for blood-bought, born-again children of God who need victory and breakthrough through the hindrances that are over their life today. And God, today we will break through to the peace and the power that you promise us. In Jesus' name I pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How, nobody looking around. How many would say, Pastor, I'm here and I'm the guy you're describing, the intruder, the outsider. <sighs> I'm not right. I'm in rebellion. I've been living my own life. I, I, I want to know Jesus. I want to be able to go into his presence every day. I don't want to be kept away from him any longer. I don't want to be held at arm's length. Today, I'm ready to surrender and give up and give my life to Jesus. Let me see your hand. Come on, put it up there high, strong. Every, come, yeah, that's it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Just on the far right section. Next section. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. And this middle section says, "How many? I need Jesus." One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Over here to the left, where, where Gretchen sits. This section. I'm looking for you. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Over here where the young adults sit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need Jesus. Up in the risers. I'm looking directly up here. Yeah, one, two, three. See in the back row. Middle section of the risers. Looking for you. One, two, three, four. Over here, far right. Yes, one, two, three, four. Add it up, folks. People needing Jesus today. Pray this prayer out loud. If you raised your hand, pray it out loud. If you didn't raise your hand, pray it out loud. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus who gives me my breakthrough. Receive me now a sinner. Take away my shame. Take away my failures. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Live with me forever. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's praise him. Praise him. I've gone long today. I'm sorry. Just stick with me for a second longer. Stand right now if you've got hindrances over your life. You feel like there are just things that are, there's warfare over your life. There's things that God wants to do in your life that you've asked him for, but it hasn't happened yet. And you need a breakthrough today through those hindrances. Just stand. Come on. Don't think about it. Just stand. You know if it's in your life or not. Just stand. Don't, don't, don't spiritualize it. Don't overthink it. Listen, there's folks standing all over this room with you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Right now, stand to your feet and say, God, I want a breakthrough today. God, I want to break through the hindrances. Satan cannot keep from me what you have promised me. Come on, lift your hands with mine right now. Father,
Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all these folks that are standing from right to left to front to back, that Lord, you would touch them with your mighty power, that God, you would break through the hindrances in the heavens, that there is no principality, power, ruler of darkness and high place that can keep the promises of God from them. Father, I pray right now that whatever is hindering, Lord, the manifestation of miracles, of signs, of wonders, God, right now we pray, Lord, that your blood would take care of it. That, Lord, right now you would neutralize, disarm uh, every force of darkness which tries to attack us in our life. And I pray, God, that behind the hindrance, you will right now release your peace, release your power to do whatever needs to be done in the lives of these people so that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has secured them through his resurrection power. God, right now, may the resurrection power of Jesus fill their heart and life. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, let's lift up a shout of praise to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Everybody stand, everybody stand. If you're not standing, stand with us now. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for salvation, Go to the commons, go to the cross. We have come up with a name for it. It's called the great exchange. Exchanging your darkness for his light. We got merch coming to a church near you, okay? We, it, it'll, it'll get here soon. We're gonna have t-shirts made up, the whole deal. You go out there and you say, listen, I prayed that prayer a minute. You fill out a card, they're gonna give you a light bulb. You're gonna write your name on that light bulb saying that I, the light of Jesus is shining in me. You go up there, screw it in the cross. Listen, we filled up the cross in four weeks. It has been emptied again, but we're believing it's gonna fill up this week and next weekend through Easter that literally there's 263 light bulbs. They're all gonna be gone by next Sunday by faith in Jesus. You be a part of it by what you've already experienced today. God bless you, I love you. Come on, can we celebrate those who made that decision this morning to follow Jesus? Come on, there's no greater decision you could ever make. We are so excited for you. But hey, before I dismiss you, I wanna let you know that next week is Easter Sunday, okay? And you might've seen that this past Saturday, we had to cancel our explosion event that was gonna happen on our campus for all the kids. But we have good news. We are gonna be still doing passing out all 30,000 eggs in all three of our services next Sunday during our kids' services. So families, make sure that you bring your kids, get them here. Now I said this first service, I'm gonna say it again. This is for kids only. So if you're like 54 years old, don't be tackling the kids trying to grab some candy, all right? <laughs> but hey, we wanna let you know that that is still happening. So be sure to attend next Sunday. But let me pray for you. Lord, we love you so much. Father, we pray over every person that you'd bless them and keep them, that you would cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. And Lord, that you would grant them your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go with God this week. We love you so much.